Okay, good evening uh, everyone to our uh, ERC webinar. We uh, will allow everyone to uh, come in gradually and uh, we will start at uh, 8 p.m. sharp as, uh, as planned. So I'll give all attendees a couple of minutes to uh, join us. Almost 80 people already joined. So we'll give you a couple of more minutes before we start our webinar on airway and ventilation. For those who are already in, I would like to remember that you can ask your questions through the Q&A and uh, we will try to answer them either immediately or after the presentations during the, the panel uh, discussion. So no need to, to raise your hand. If you have a question, you can submit it through the Q&A. The meeting will also be recorded and you will be able to uh, watch it on our Facebook page at a later time or on the website. Okay, numbers are still going up, but I suggest we, uh, we start uh, our webinar right away and try to finish within the uh, time slot we, uh, we allocated for this webinar. So once again, a very warm welcome to, uh, to all of you. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to join us uh, on a Friday evening. Uh, tonight I'm uh, happy to host uh, three uh, eminent speakers. Uh, Anita Simons, good evening. Uh, Anita is a professor of respiratory medicine in, uh, in London. And uh, Anita will talk about um, the evidence gaps and, and risk of aerosol transmission uh, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have Jess Saw, uh, who's an uh, intensivist in, uh, in Bristol. Good evening, Jess. Good evening. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll talk as, um, as a second speaker on uh, the, the key messages from the, the randomized controlled trials um, and COVID-19 implications. And our last speaker will be uh, Tino Greif, uh, who is a professor of uh, anesthesia in Bern. Uh, good evening, Tino. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you again. And Tino will talk about uh, video laryngoscopy and uh, apnea oxygenation uh, during uh, COVID-19. Uh, so a very warm welcome and thanks for, uh, for being here uh, tonight. Um, as a first speaker, as announced, we will uh, start with uh, Professor Anita Simons. Uh, Anita, once again, thank you uh, for your presence and your time. And I will hand over to you as a first speaker. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, this is an interesting topic. Uh, I think increasingly a controversial one, even this week. In terms of the principles of transmission of infection, uh, 
that can be uh, by a number of routes, either by close contact, usually by a large droplet, or airborne transmission by smaller aerosol uh, droplets, or by direct contact or by fom fomites. And broadly speaking, for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, most authorities believe that this is transmitted by respiratory droplets or contact with contaminated surfaces. And so up till now, the predominant modes of transmission have been felt to be droplet or contact. And that's held by the World Health Organization and a variety of other authorities. Um, it's important because it really makes a difference as to whether the airborne route is important. And when we think of other conditions, infections that are transmitted by the airborne route, the most notable are those of pulmonary tuberculosis, of measles and of chickenpox. And crucially, the R factor, the number of people who are infected by one index case is usually most much greater but with airborne infections than uh, droplet infections. Just a, a reminder of the difference between the two, so listed here are uh, principles of aerosol transmission and here droplet transmission. By and large the cutoff point is believed to be around five microns and particles smaller than five microns uh, called aerosol tend to be defined as aerosol and those larger than five to ten microns as droplets. Their mass, their size affects uh, how they behave and the larger particles tend to be behave ballistically. Because they have larger mass, they will drop out and then uh, uh, arrive on, on, on the sur surfaces around the individual. Whereas aerosols, the smaller particles, can stay uh, suspended in air for a period of time, more than minutes or even hours. Also by virtue of size, the smaller particles, the aerosol can enter into the airway, they're respirable, less than five microns, and go down to the lower uh, respiratory tract. Whereas by and large, particles less than 10 microns can get into the upper airway, but won't travel down to the uh, lower airways. And it's also true that you need relatively smaller doses of airborne virus by and large to generate infection than uh, the amount of droplet transmission. Now, as I say, that was generally accepted by uh, uh, most as the main causes of, of transmission, but in the last week or so, and you can see uh, this is uh, an article from the front page of the New York Times. This is from a, a, London, uh, a UK newspaper with 239 experts writing to the WHO saying that there is increasing evidence that COVID is uh, not just transmitted by droplets and direct contact, but is also airborne and transmitted by aerosol. Now, let's just, I think it's helpful to look at uh, why we do what we do now in terms of use of PPE and the use of um, the term aerosol generating procedures. Most of this dates back to SARS-1, the original episode, 2003-2004 when they looked at super spreading events and the odds ratio of uh, factors that tended to generate these super spreading events. And you can see that there are a number of different factors, physical factors such as short distance between the beds of the patient. So these are super spreading events in a, in a hospital ward. Uh, characteristics of what staff did. So if you provided washing and changing facilities, the odds ratio went down as they were working with symptoms, uh, not surprising, the odds ratio went up. And then specifically, the performance of various uh, treatment interventions, use of high flow oxygen, resuscitation, and then uh, uh, requirement for oxygen, use of non-invasive ventilation uh, being uh, the main ones. And as a result of that, what has uh, come about is this list of procedures which are labeled aerosol generating procedures. And as you know, they're to do with intubation, upper airway interventions, tracheostomy, surgery, and also use non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, 
high flow nasal oxygen therapy and, and induction of sputum. And that is why we use a different level of uh, PPE, enhanced PPE with FFP3 masks and so forth for those procedures uh, as opposed to others. And there is some data backing that up. Uh, here is some work done at, at the time of H1N1, looking at droplet size in patients, and this is opt optical particle sizes, so it's looking at the size of particles during runs in individuals receiving non-invasive ventilation, receiving oxygen therapy, and then nebulized bronchodilator. These actually here are large droplets. These are droplets over 10 microns in size. And whereas non-invasive ventilation generated these larger droplets, so not aerosol droplets, if that circuit was modified with the placement of a um, bacterial and viral filter, so filtering the exhalate, the droplet count went down. Oxygen itself didn't generate a uh, uh, droplets or aerosol, and that was a 60% high flow oxygen. Um, the only intervention in these experiments that did create an aerosol, so these are the small particles, less than uh, 5 uh, micron, 0.5 microns, 1 to 3 microns, was actually the nebulized uh, bronchodilator. But of note was the fact that the characteristics of the aerosol from the nebulizer were actually entirely consistent with what the nebulizer was supposed to generate. So this is nebulized drug, not um, aerosol coming from the patient. Now, another controversial topic too um, is whether the different components of resuscitation are as risky. Now I, I think we accept that airway intubation is so but there is a difference of opinion as to whether chest compression on its own is a risk. And um, These are some experiments, this is published in uh, uh, recently in resuscitation where the authors did some simulations. This is a mannequin here. They nebulized into the mannequin uh, a detergent that then in ultraviolet light, you could see it light up and then provide, um, a, gave this mannequin a uh, chest wall compression. And you can see that there was a plume uh, generated with the chest wall compression on this uh, mannequin simulator. The difficulty here is you don't know, you can see something's generated, so you generate an exhalate, but you don't know the size of the droplets, whether it's an aerosol or, uh, or large droplets. And of course, you equally don't know how infectious that material is. And so there are differences of opinion. So here, this group here, this is in the UK, they reviewed the data and say that they don't regard chest compression as aerosol generating. But the European Resuscitation uh, Council COVID-19 guidelines published in, in, in April uh, say that because the chest compressions have the potential to generate aerosol, that they recommend that it is regarded as aerosol generating uh, and that full enhanced PPE is used. That's different though to applying defibrillation, show a shockable rhythm, you would be able to reasonably go and do that with a straightforward lower level PPE or, 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 or even possibly as a bystander without. Um, but uh, so that you wouldn't have to don the PPE to do and that sounds pretty reasonable. So, where are we in terms of these dilemmas and, uh, and differences of opinion? I think what's happened is there is now uh, an ongoing rethink as to whether this fairly arbitrary decision into uh, less than five microns and more than five microns is sensible. Because specifically, and this is, happens to be a sneeze, but you can see it with a, with a cough. And of course, cough is a cardinal feature of COVID-19. Or you can even see it to some extent with exhalates for, for, for people who are speaking and even singing. In that what you have is a plume of some aerosol, some large gobbets, and a whole range of, of particles. So not just droplets, not just aerosol, a mixture of all of those. 
as I mentioned, even though, even if you can size the particles, it doesn't tell you whether viral RNA is present within the particles. And even if you detect viral RNA, we don't know whether that is infectious in its own right. And there've been quite a few environmental studies done recently showing that there is a lot of viral contamination with viral RNA in accident and emergency departments, in CPAP units, um, but you can't necessarily culture it, and so it may not be infectious. It also implies that all sorts of other factors matter, so the ventilation and the rate of removal, and that is why the advice being outside is much safer than being inside. I just want to mention briefly before I come to the end, this interesting but rather sad example that again makes us rethink about um, airborne transmission. This is a case of a, a, a choir that met on March the 10th um, in, in Washington. And they met uh, to rehearse. And of the individuals there, of uh, 53 out of 61 individuals became infected with COVID. There was one index case um, and the vast majority of them became infected. But when they did the detailed epidemiology and looked at contact between the members, there was, it was impossible to see that there was enough direct com contact or enough uh, droplet type contact for them. This number of people who have been infected by droplet or direct contact mechanisms. And so it's this kind of evidence that is building the case that there is at least a degree of airborne transmission. And these graphs just show, depending on the dosage of, of exhalate, as it were, and then the rate of loss, which would be via ventilation or um, depositing out of circulation, or the amount of time of exposure, so half an hour compared to one hour, compared to two hours or 2.5 hours, obviously larger volume, higher risk, so this is a risk of infection, and the longer time duration of exposure, the higher risk too. So I just finished by saying um, there are lots of implications as there is a degree of, of aerosol airborne type infection and the and WHO are starting to recognize that it may happen in, in specific circumstances um, and that uh, in these sort of situations crowded uh, closely packed poorly ventilated settings are obviously more likely to be at risk but medically I, I think we have to say it's not feasible to use enhanced PPE for everything that we do and that means that I think it'll come down to risk assessment uh, and a balance of context taking into account the prevalence of COVID in the population and a whole range of contextual and clinical circumstances, which makes life more difficult, but means we have to have a more nuanced approach to PPE. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Anita, for this uh, very uh, informative presentation. Um, controversial, as you, as you said, and, and maybe I can throw uh, a first uh, controversial question uh, when it comes to, uh, to resuscitation. Um, as you stated, there is a little bit uh, discussion on whether it is an aerosol generating or, or should be considered as an aerosol generating procedure. What would be your personal uh, opinion uh, on that? Because from the time being, uh, the risk exists that we are withholding uh, victims of cardiac arrest from bystander CPR because it is considered uh, aerosol generating and then people might be afraid of, uh, of resuscitating a victim. So how, how would you, uh, or what would you advocate uh, with regard to resuscitation and chest compressions? You're, you're right, I think you do have to divide it obviously into bystander type events. I mean, there are some publications recently making a number of assumptions, but uh, even uh, where the prevalence is reasonably high, still when for an out of hospital event, the risk to that individual, uh, a, a rescuer is, is relatively low. Our own calculations have been within the hospital working on the front line here. I, working on a, a, as a respiratory physician, 
on the respiratory ward with, with the COVID patients. Um, we know the cardiac background, we know a lot about them, and we, we are fully expecting to actually intubate these patients unless it's obviously a shockable rhythm and arrhythmogenic. So in the cardiac arrest we've had on our ward, we have, we have done to go in. Um, but I think if it was a you know, primary cardiac event, um, you, you wouldn't. You would use uh, surgical um, PPE and, and, and you would, you, you would um, shock them without putting on full PPE. Okay, that, that makes sense. And, and it has also to be stressed that uh, at least 80% of, of cardiac arrests occur in a, in a uh, home situation and are much more likely to be relatives or people within your inner circle. Uh, so that is already, is also important uh, with, with bystander. Agreed, very important. Okay, we, we will have room for, for more questions. I suggest that uh, we, uh, we welcome our second speaker, uh, Jess Saw, uh, and we'll uh, dive a little deeper into uh, airway randomized control trials uh, and might already answer some of the, of the questions uh, for us. Hi, Jess. Good evening. Hi. Um, I'll just share my screen. Are you, are you seeing my slides? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. Right. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, I've been asked to just address some key messages from recent um, randomized control trials and speak a bit about the implications for COVID-19. So when we think of airway interventions, we think in hospital, out of hospital, and we think compression only, the pocket mask or mouth to mouth, bag mask ventilation and here we're showing two-person bag valve mask ventilation use of a supraglottic airway tracheal intubation and again in a variety of settings so cardiac arrest can happen in the home in fact that's 80 percent of out of hospital cardiac arrest in public spaces and then in hospital they can be in critical care areas where teams are often already wearing a lot of PPE or on general wards. So there's a whole range of settings where interventions can occur. There have been three large randomised trials, all published in 2018 in JAMA, that looked at airway interventions during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. The CAM trial from France the PART trial from North America, and the Airways 2 study from the UK. And I'll just quickly remind you of what they showed. So the CAM trial was a French study where they compared bag mask ventilation with tracheal intubation for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And the intubators were all emergency physicians who were working at a very high airway expertise level and the key finding in this study was that there was no difference in 28 day survival for 4.3 percent in the bag mask group 4.2 percent in the tracheal tube group and the intubation success rate was 98 percent and my only comment about this study would be that the people doing the interventions were good at using a bag and mask and they were good at tracheal intubation. And if a patient was difficult to use a bag and mask on, they intubated them. So 10% of the patients in the bag mask group got intubated. And, but it, this is, so there was quite a lot of crossover. So both, both these interventions work well in a setting with a high intubation success rate. The next study was the PART study, and this was a multi-center study in North America where pre-hospital emergency medical technicians, they either used a laryngeal tube or a tracheal tube. So the laryngeal tube is a 
supraglottic airway device. And they had 3,004 patients. And the primary endpoint was survival at three days. And this study had a higher survival rate in the laryngeal tube group, 18.2% versus 15.3% for tracheal tube. But only 51% of the patients in the tracheal tube group had intubation success. So the intubation success rate was very low. And so this study tells us that if you can't intubate, you're better off using a laryngeal tube. The third study, which is the largest, had over 9,000 patients compared the eye gel versus tracheal intubation. And this is a UK study and the primary outcome was 30 day neuro good neurological outcome. And again, there was no difference between the eye gel and the tracheal tube, 6.4% versus 6.8%. And in this study, the intubation success rate was 70% within two attempts. So again, if you if you've got intubation success rate of 70%, the eye gel is equivalent to using a tracheal tube or similar to. So Ilcor looked at this and wrote guidelines and the bottom line, the guidelines came up with a stepwise approach and it's choosing the option that works best in the hands of a rescuer. So if you have no airway skills, compression only, if you're trained in mouth to mouth, use that. If you can only do bag mask, do two person bag mask. And the key with this is that you should only really be using tracheal intubation if you are working in a system with a 95% plus intubation success rate in one or two attempts. And all other systems should stick to the supraglottic airway or a bag mask. And for non-experts, much simpler techniques. So that's where the current ILCOR guideline, ILCOR consensus on science is and where the ERC guidelines are. So what about if you add COVID to the mix? So the ERC has done some guidelines that came out last month and Keith Cooper and colleagues did a, in, did a systematic review looking at infection risk and specifically at chest compressions as well. And the problem is that there's no good high quality studies that provide us with any high certainty evidence of what the risk is in terms of catching or becoming infected from a COVID patient. So it's very hard to put a figure on the level of risk and the guidelines have gone towards what we're all taught when we do CPR training which is your first priority is your own safety before starting resuscitation so you know rescue safety comes first. So what do we do when we have COVID? So we've dropped mouth to mouth all these other options are still an option and you know, compression only, maybe using mouth coverings both on the patient and on the rescuer. And then for bagging, supraglottic airway, tracheal intubation using airborne precaution PPE. And the, the issue with these is that the tracheal tube, which is a tube in the trachea with a cuff, cuff up, gives you the best seal. So once the tube's in, you've isolated the airway where it's the most difficult technique. So again, rescuers have to choose the technique that works best for them. And just reminding people what airborne precaution PPE is, gloves, long sleeve gowns. This is taken from the ERC guidelines, a FFP3 mask or a N99 mask and a N90, N95 if you don't have an FFP3, eye and face protection, or a powered res respirator or hood and using a face shield. So just, just some pictures here. So this is from the Rhesus Council UK website. And so you know, the simplest thing you could do 
in an as a hospital setting is to cover the victim's face like their mouth and nose before starting chest compressions and ideally if you're wearing what if you've got one wearing a mask yourself and doing compression only cpr this is a picture i took of me about a couple of hours ago in before intubating a patient on our icu where i'm wearing a face shield and a half face respirator with a filter a gown gloves um, that's been the standard practice in our ICU and when we've been doing resuscitation and we're still doing that even though the number of cases of COVID we're seeing are actually relatively small at the moment. The other thing that is part of the guidelines is using a viral filter between the circuit and the airway and this means that any expiratory exhaled breaths from the patient are filtered before they go into the room. The key about this is that you do have to buy a filter that the manufacturer has manufactured that actually contains a viral filter. So you can get humidifiers, HMEs, and you can get viral filters and you can get HME and filters combined. So this is a HME viral filter combined in a breathing circuit. This is my final slide of some take home messages. So the first is you should ideally have, a, have the most skilled airway person if you're going to do any airway interventions. You need to take airborne precaution PPE. Trachyl intubation is the most difficult technique but provides the best seal. Uh, I know the next speaker is going to talk about video laryngoscopy that can make it that can give you more distance potentially and you also need to have a viral filter in the circuit thank you very much thank you just for uh, for your presentation uh, please allow me to to ask your first question with with regard to skill uh, complexity uh, someone is is wondering if uh, it would not be easier to teach uh, supraglottic airway uh, techniques than uh, back valve mask uh, technique because the back valve mask technique at least one person is also a rather complex uh, skill uh, whilst supraglottic airway might be a little bit easier how do you i i actually agree on that and i didn't have time to mention it in in that i think for a single person a supraglottic airway may give equivalent success so and in my practice the eye gel is the simplest supraglottic airway to use in that it doesn't rely on inflating a cuff you just put it in you collect the circuit so a supraglottic airway device would probably be similar to using a bag mask and maybe superior. So you have to use a technique that works best for that person. And unfortunately, there's never been a head-to-head -head trial of bag mask versus a supraglottic airway device or not, not yet anyway. Okay, well, and in addition to, uh, to the, the supraglottic airway, um, an attendee is, uh, is asking, should we cover the victim's face with a, a towel or a clear plastic drape in case of pharyngeal leak? I think all those, all those things are theoretically or seem attractive, but I'm not sure how much they add in terms of practicality and in terms of you've got to then once you've got it you've got to move it out of the way etc and trying to keep things simple would be the easiest thing and i must admit when i've whenever i had a leak i've sort of just shut the patient's mouth and nose <laughs> yeah yeah and try to yeah you've got to try and work on correcting the leak and putting a tap, you know, putting something over the patient's face or something with a big leak with a superglottic airway is in effect accepting you're going to stay with the leak, you know. I think you know, repositioning the device or shutting the mouth and things like that, that may give you better mitigation. 
Okay, especially regarding the fact that as a rescuer in hospital, you are already wearing full or expected to wear full PPE as well as protective barrier. And I think we have to accept that there are going to be short delays while people put on PPE and that uh, yeah, if you're in hospital, hopefully patients are at a high risk of cardiac arrest are managed in areas where people have rapid access to PPE. And for out of hospital, you know, the first responders are focusing on chest compressions, early defibrillation. And the only patients who are missing out of that group that would do badly, irrespective of if they got in airway interventions or not. Okay, thank you very much, Jess. We, we will come back to you, uh, I guess, with a number of more questions uh, after, after Tino's presentation. Tino, welcome. Okay. You are going to welcome. talk about video laryngoscopes and apneic oxygenation as uh, alternative to the basic techniques. Uh, thanks. First of all, there was also a question about the use of filters, Jess. Do you think these filters should also be placed between the back and the mask and laryngeal mask close to the patient only to make this clear? Yes, it's important to do that. So filters should be part of the bag mask device or between the supraglottic airway and the bag because ultimately when the patient breathes out you need to filter their exhaled breath. Okay, thanks. Um, I will share also my screen and you should see now a short, I have only some very few, only a few slides. Okay, so uh, why, the question is why should we use video laryngoscope? So in the, in the entire resuscitation literature, this was not a, a topic and suddenly with COVID it pops up and even it's recommended to use a, a video laryngoscope. And the, the reason behind this is obviously with a video learning scope, you see more than using the standard classic uh, direct laryngoscopy with a, with a Macintosh plate. So the idea behind this, if you can see more, why not having uh, a device which, which you have a better view. There are in the meantime, enough studies from a variety of settings emergency room, out of hospital, anesthesia, that it shows a greater first pass effect in tracheal intubation. And we know also from a lot of study, the more often you have to, to intend to do, it, you do a second, third attempt on intubation, the harder it gets. You have swelling, bleeding, injuries. So the first pass effect is really a measurement of effectivity. And we see is as quite effective. Now the COVID uh, comes now in that uh, a lot of people, if they are performing an intubation, are very close to the mouth of the patient. And with a video laryngoscope, you have a little bit more distance to the patient if you are used to this. But for me, the much, the highest point is the change in the behavior for the team performance. And I would like to show you uh, the next slide, if this is working, but it's not working. Next slide. Okay. Uh, if you look at this, this is from simulations, so or this is a mannequin, but usually this happens. She tries to visualize the glottis, where is it? And we can see from the facial expression, it's not easy. The helping person beside, she expresses, she doesn't see anything. She doesn't know, she does not know what's going on, how she could help. She, isn't, she even doesn't, is, uh, doesn't try to speak to her. So this is a the typical situation. The other guy is fixing on the, on the monitor, doing nothing. With the introduction of, of a video laryngoscope, suddenly, the entire scenario changes. Now, everybody in the room, the surgeons, the assistants, the, the nurses, everybody sees what's going on. This is maybe not a COVID uh, case because we see, and it's very strange, and all these guys don't have a mask on, but 
now we, we are changing the entire intubation from a single intubation hero like this to a group interaction. And for years we were talking about non-technical skills, helping each other, communication. Here it does not happen, but now it's possible. People know exactly what to do, which device could help, where to press, where to move the larynx. larynx. And that's a, a major point. So I think in a couple of years, people will use only video laryngoscope simply because it helps to get the tube in. This is specifically for intubation. And in, if, if you think on COVID and now Jess explained quite easily when intubation should be used for people who are trained, but then use the device. In the meantime, we have single use video laryngoscopes, the prices are falling down. So this is the argument, if you have it, use it in the normal airway to train for the difficult one. So this is my first part of the video laryngoscope and maybe we can discuss later any other issue on this. The next thing is uh, apneic oxygenation. Why do we even talk about this? Uh, the idea behind this is we put on oxygen on the face and the oxygen, oxygen is somehow going into the lungs. Uh, it's not that easy. The concept is quite clear. It exists, it exists over 100 years ago. It was published in Germany. The, the reason behind this is we, we have an oxygen consumption about 250 milliliters. The production of CO2, so the oxygen is going in, the CO2 is going out is less, only 200 milliliters. This is the respiratory corrosion. So this means 250 milliliter in, into tissue, but only 200 milliliter out, out, and so a negative pressure into the direction of the alveoli is created. It works only if there's enough oxygen from this side, so 100% oxygen into this side. The limitation obviously is the increasing CO2 here in blood, in tissue, and also in the alveoli. But for uh, a rather short period, up to five, 10, 15 minutes, it works perfectly. It works, and as I said before, only if oxygen is, is in the alveoli, which means it has to come from the airway, and therefore, an open airway is needed. And what I mean by an open airway is this, not putting a mask on the face, this guy is still awake, but if he is not, he is either anesthetized or in cardiac arrest, all the, the, the tongue falls back to the, to the post posterior wall of the pharynx, so the, the airway is closed. To open the airway, you have to do this maneuver, the, the selic, um, um, the, uh, the, it's, jaw it's, it's called jaw thrust. So this opens the airway and then oxygen, what, however you, you, you provide it, either with nasal prongs or a mask, or you intubate, or you have a laryngoscope, so the airway is open, or you put in a, 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 a supraglottic airway, the eye gel in this case. So then oxygen, 100% oxygen delivered can enter into the trachea and the alveoli. Same here. This means with COVID, that is all possible only with uh, proper protection equipment. This is not a procedure if you are not protected. The idea to put only a mask on this and having a flow is not, uh, is not apneic oxygenation because a simple mask we have, a lot of people have in the hospital, produces only an oxygen concentration in the maximum with a very high flow of 30, 35 or 40%, which is far too less to make this inflow of oxygen possible. So if you think on oxygenation, you have to do this, to provide oxygen. Only putting a mask is maybe a protection 
for if if some viruses are exhaled because somebody's pressing the, ch the chest we saw this before but a high flow in this position rather I see as an, uh, the danger of distributing viruses, aerosols in the room. And we had this before in the first presentation, high flow oxygen is an aerosol generating procedure. That's all what I would, wanted to present on this topic. And with this, I think we can open the discussion again. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Tino. Uh, first question. Uh, with regard to video laryngoscopy, which kind of uh, video laryngoscope would you recommend? Uh, the one with a separate screen or, or the one with a screen attached to the handle, which uh, retains your preference? Yeah. So I would re recommend you use the video laryngoscope you have and you are trained in. If you, if you are new, you knew and if you look, then you have to decide. The separate screen has an advantage or moving around for teaching purposes or more people can see it, you can trans transmit it to a larger screen. The, the, the video laryngoscopes where the screen is in the handle or attached to the handle have advantages. For example, an out of hospital, if you use a single use product, it's closer to you. The screen is smaller. So the visibility, the, the big advantage is not so that big. The most important thing with video laryngoscopy is you have to learn it, you have to train it in a normal case. Don't use a video laryngoscope if you never have used it before because now comes in a difficult case or now we have to intubate a COVID patient and the, the guidelines say use a video laryngoscope and you never did it before. Then you will have trouble and then the success might not be that high. So training as with, with every new medical device is of importance. Okay, well, and, and someone is asking uh, if there is any value in, in applying a non rebreathing uh, mask during CPR for apnea oxygenation or only uh, as an aerosol generating protection system. Uh, you have to consider whatever you put uh, over the mouth and the nose, and the higher the flow the more spreads around because this is the, all these masks are not sealing. And if the idea behind is, I want to put in into the patient a high concentration of oxygen because maybe there's an, uh, an, an uh, uh, agonal breathing, then somebody has to make the jaw thrust because you need an open airway to get, to, to get oxygen in. If you have full protection, you can do whatever you want. Then I'm totally open. Then open, open the airway, put in a, a sealing mask and then high flow because then it should stay all in the, in the circuit you have on the ICU or in the OR. If you are out of hospital, then in a normal victim, the, the simple mask on the face might protect a little bit against spreading of viruses while somebody is pushing the chest, like putting a towel over the face. But a high flow, in my, my opinion, simply my opinion, is rather spreading around viruses. Why should I do this? And I cannot get the oxygen in. Okay, thank you uh, for your, uh, your presentation and your, uh, your comments, uh, Tino. Um, Another question is that uh, someone mentions rescuers in Canada got SARS CoV 2 despite wearing PPE. Should we assume there may be a leak regardless of technique? Is one of the, uh, the questions. So, any one of you who wants to uh, comment on that? I, I can add, I was going to say that there's a recent paper in the British Medical Journal from Wuhan saying that when the PPE was well used, the risk of infection to um, the, the, the team members wearing the PPE is incredibly low. And I think that's coming out from the current episode that where there have been infection of healthcare workers, they have tended not to be intensivists and uh, anaesthetists. It tends to be those in accident emergency departments, ENT surgeons, carers and so on. I, 
I mean, I think there's often a learning curve at the beginning of an event where people are not sure what's going on. They're not sure who's infected. There can be issues with wearing the PPE. So I, my own personal reading of the data is if you're secure with your PPE, then the risk is, is pretty low. Okay. Uh there, there, are also, there are also quite nice studies showing when they looked at, at spread of uh, virus RNA, a lot was found in the changing rooms and in the pausing rooms. People seem to be very carefully when they are doing the procedures, putting it away. But when it's over, sometimes people lost, are losing their, their, their precautions. So a, se a second person observing how all the waste material is, is done properly after procedure is very important to avoid this. Okay, thank, thank you both for this, uh, this answer. Uh, we talked a lot, lot of uh, in, in hospital uh, management, uh, a number of people are asking uh, how can first aiders uh, safely help people uh, in cardiac arrest, so bystander CPR, and uh, CPR for a relative with, uh, with COVID. Do you want me to answer that? Uh, so, first of all, once calling for help is the first thing, dialing 112, 11999 in England. Uh, and then if it's a relative and you already live with them, your chances of, the chances are you've already got whatever infection they've got so your risks your relative risk may be lower just to carry on doing chest compressions and airway interventions as if you would do them anyway but if it's someone if it's a stranger i would still recommend focusing on compressions and early defibrillation while you're awaiting the ems to come unless you've got PPE for airway interventions. And that, that does you know, mean there may be delays in airway interventions, but uh, early compressions and early defibrillation will hopefully resuscitate many of the people who are going to do well. Okay, so that, that makes sense. Uh, someone is asking, and, and you already gave part of the answer, if moving a victim from bed or where else uh, to the ground is a potential risk. Uh, he asked, could we imagine outdooring a victim for safer maneuvers? But that uh, goes a bit, uh, against your uh, recommendation for early start of, of chest compression, I imagine. Yeah, I think those things add time. So clearly, if you've got someone in an enclosed space, that limits your access, moving them to somewhere where it's easier to do chest compressions is a good move. The actual moving the individual per se doesn't create aerosol. It's the fact that it just causes a delay. And I think people forget how heavy people are to move. So if you're on your own, it's quite hard to move someone from a bed to the floor or to outside. So if there's several of you, it's the sort of thing the EMS crew or someone else might do. But when you're on your own, it's actually quite hard to do in that the victim is literally a dead weight. You know, you've, it's quite hard to move someone. Okay. And then maybe one last uh, question, uh, I guess, uh, might be something for Anita. Someone is asking if uh, UV light is useful for room disinfection after airborne intervention. I have to say, honestly, I don't know, or I don't know how I'd even start doing that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't give a good answer to that, maybe, but how, how does one do it? Yeah, I was going to say, in a lot of intensive care units now, use these light systems for decontaminating rooms and areas, but I, I don't know how they work. I think it's a specific wavelength of light, but Fair enough. you do have to clean the surfaces and everything. And sure. it's done as a final quick clean type intervention. I, I don't think it's a live intervention that you can do while you're trying to resuscitate someone. Do you know you want? Uh, 
when when I when I read all this stuff and question about UV light, if this if this really would work, so if sunlight would light would work, why do we have then this virus? When sunlight is all the time there, and 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 so this is a concept which I don't understand. Because the, the, this virus is supposed to come from from animals, and and there's sunlight out. So if sunlight really would UV light would eliminate these these germs, uh, we won't have this after millions of years. Okay, I see that we have addressed almost uh, all of the the questions. There are no more questions coming up, so uh, we are ten minutes before the end of our webinar. Um, I would like every speaker to uh, give us a take home message to uh, to take back uh, to our working place and I'll start with the ladies first, uh, Nita. Thank you. Well, I think most of transmission is, is droplet and contact, but I think we need to be increasingly aware that there is an aerosol element. And not only does it affect what we do in hospital, it should be borne in mind when we're out and about and living our own lives, because it very much affects um, our, our chances of uh, contracting the condition. Thank you. Jess, do you want to share a take home message with us? I think the take home message regarding airway strategies during CPR is using the option that works best in your hands, which could be not doing any airway intervention at all to tracheal intubation or supraglottic airway or bag mask. And if you do do those, minimizing your risk by covering the victim's face and your own face but for any advanced interventions such that involve ventilating the lungs, you really need to have airborne level protection. So a mask that's a filtering mask, face shields, gloves, gowns. Thank you. And last but not least, Dino. I would like to say, use what you learned, train with your devices, uh, if you have a video laryngoscope and you, you are trained in intubation, use it because you have it. And be reading all these questions, there are a lot of very special circumstances, but we have to think on if we don't do CPR, more people will die than get infected. There are studies also out showing, calculating how many people might die because of a COVID infection, even as a rescuer. But on the other hand, there are now more and more studies showing that people are not coming to the emergency room, uh, myocardial infarctions are not treated, strokes are not coming. So people suffer more and more because of fear, not uh, for the hospital or people are not providing CPR and Providing CPR might save much more life than a possible infection of COVID. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for your uh, pre very useful presentation. Got a lot of uh, positive reaction from our audience uh, as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending our webinar. Stay safe and uh, have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Thanks, bye bye. Thank you.